I'm Roy Richardson. I'm Jason's father. Uh, Jason's uh, album is coming out pretty soon, and this is his documentary. So he was, well, he, you know, he grew up around stuff, right? I have friends who, you know, their kids did the same thing. They grew up around it, but they didn't take to it. So Jason took to it. It wasn't forced on him. Uh, you know, what, you know, he saw me doing it, I guess. I don't know. He, he liked it. had instruments around the house always like always because my dad's a musician so they've always just kind of been like chilling there and i've seen videos of me playing a piano before i could even walk like literally just like a little small octave or two and just like literally banging on it for like and not making any sense at all just a baby literally banging on a piano uh and that was actually the first instrument i picked up or i first started learning guitar is fourth and that's the one that just ended up working the best so i stuck with that Ever since he was little, I mean, he's been like banging on drums and banging on pianos. But this one right here, if you can look at that, where he's playing this guy's 62 Stratocaster. And um, so they came out to the daycare and, you know, they said, does anybody want to play guitar? So Jason runs up and says, uh, you know, they, they strap the guitar on him. And so they start doing a song and he's just standing there. And like, come on, you're supposed to play the guitar. And he looks at him and says, I need a pick. And they wouldn't, they, he wouldn't play it until they gave him a pick. They, they were cracking up. They never had that happen before. In middle school, they had a, uh, you, you had to take uh, strings, band, or choir, or, you know, chorus. And so he took strings, played a violin for two years. Then he switched over into the band and played percussion in the band. Then in high school, um, continued on doing stuff with, with taking music theory classes and um, played with the Prince William Youth Orchestra, playing percussion. He took drum lessons, he took piano lessons. He kept jumping around from thing to thing and I was thinking, well, he's not gonna figure out, you know, one thing or the other. And uh, then he's like, oh, I wanna play guitar. I'm like, well, you've, you've quit piano, you've quit drums, you're, you know, now you want guitar, so. I went and found a gothic Les Paul, which is a black Les Paul. It's kind of one of the cheaper ones. Thinking, well, in two years when he decides to, that he doesn't want to play guitar, I'll have a decent guitar hanging around. Uh, the Les Paul is here because it doesn't have enough frets or strings. I was playing drums before I started focusing on guitar as my main instrument. And the main reasoning behind it was that I wanted to write songs. Drums don't have notes, they're just rhythms and just it's just percussion. There's no like actual note involved. You can't write a song without there being, you know, like structure, notes and things like that. So that was the main motivating force for me to start doing that. I'm Dan Hauser and I play bass in Vail Maya. Well, I was in this band in high school and it was uh, like a shred metal band. And uh, it was with this kid named Josh. And we were looking for the second guitarist like a mutual friend found him on uh, MySpace. MySpace days, what up? <laughs> so back when MySpace was like in its prime, like the like the shit, the hot shit, I was just trying to find other dudes to play with, other dudes playing a band with that wanted to do the same thing and that could actually play it, you know what I mean? Like it's really, it's not the easiest thing in the world to find a group of dudes in the same area that can all proficiently play like technical metal and things like that. So randomly, this dude just hit me up. Wasn't in the band, just like a friend of ours from high school, messaged him and then hit us up after Jason had already said yes to like coming and jamming with us. Danny came in with like five string bass and every like drummer was playing like children boat and stuff, like perfect. And it was just the sickest like meetup ever. His dad drove him to our practice spot and sat there the whole time while we jammed with this kid that we'd never met. And it was, uh, it was awesome and weird at the same time. <laughs> and it just kept going from there. And then one day we went to I, went, I showed up at practice at Danny's house. Uh, the drummer was a massive fake. Josh bailed as well. So it was just me and Danny. After like 45 minutes of no one showing up that day, we just ended up hanging out for like four or five hours that day. And then it was pretty much just best friends from there on, just from that one, that one failed practice that they both those dudes just flaked out on. He's definitely like, I always refer to him as my best friend. I've known him for, I've known him for a decade now. Unfortunately, I think Jason is my best friend. I hate that guy.
<laughs> it's funny because I've traveled the world telling other people they bring him up. And hey, Jay, next time you see Jason, tell him that Dan from Vale hates him. <laughs> That's our relationship, though. We just say we hate each other all the time. Just like, you're ugly, things like that. Like, I hate your face. You suck. And then we're, and then it's just chill. That's just the di that's just the friendship dynamic. But his cargo shorts definitely sucked ass. Like that, uh, when that my dad pulled up that clip and we saw it for the first time, I was like literally like like keeled over with la with laughter. Like he looked real dumb, like real dumb. My cargo shorts are sick. I used to have stacks of those motherfuckers. I had so many cargo shorts, it was ridiculous. I was I was in that like awkward teen phase. I, I was a late bloomer, so like I didn't I didn't know clothes or style or any of that shit. So I was basically like wearing what my mom bought me when I was a kid. Then uh, like some Hawaiian shirt that was way too big and wasn't buttoned up, like with a dirty tank top underneath. I was like, these pants, they, they still work. They're pants. So I'll wear them, right? It wasn't like, I'm gonna go get like a nice pair of jeans, you know, something fancy. Why would I do that when I have these, uh, you know, $20 Costco, you know, pants? Oh, it was great. That he used to not give a single fuck. Like he would just like literally just like walk around barefoot. He still does that. He just walks around like barefoot, like all the time. He just disgusting hobbit feet, straight up. The only thing I knew was I liked metal and I liked bass and monster and cargo shorts. I was at band practice one day with uh, Danny and uh, a different Josh. We got another guitar player after that guy, and his name was also Josh, and he actually was really cool. Um, and he was like, "Yo, I just saw uh, All Shot Parish was looking for a new or a new lead guitar player," and I was like, "Huh, that's cool." He heard that they wanted a new guitar player and that they were taking video submissions, and he wanted me to help him create this video. And I'm like, "I'm not gonna call him." Didn't really think anything of it, like literally at all. Like I wasn't even expecting to get a response. Like I was just like, there's no way they're gonna email me back. They're probably getting hit up by so many people that are just like real sick. So I was sent them, sent that video, and on my way to school the next morning, I checked my email and I had already gotten a response. So he was a senior in high school with um, a semester left. He took all his SOLs, SATs, all his stuff. All he had to do was park his butt in a classroom for 90 days and get C's. And he would have graduated, but uh, that didn't happen. Essentially what happened was I joined, I joined All Shop Parish like 2009. I dropped out of high school to go do it. It was like February of my senior year. And then stayed with them for 10, 10 months, somewhere around there. It was, it was a little less than a year right before I bailed. And, uh, but while all my friends were graduating that summer, I was in Europe, 17 years old, playing European festivals. I was like, I definitely made the right decision. It was like, they're on stage getting handed a piece of paper and then going to sit down forever while they just hear a bunch of names getting spouted off. I'm playing in front of 20,000 people. <laughs> but I kept thinking of Dave Grohl, where his story is, you know, the same thing, where he left high school right before graduation and never looked back, and it's worked out pretty well for him. Yeah, I definitely do not regret the decision at all. But then we did, there was that Night of the Living Shred tour, which was the co-headliner between All Shall Parish and Born of Osiris. That was like, that, that would have been 2009. I think it was like, that was like the end of 2009, somewhere around there. And then that's how I met the Boo Dudes. Uh, Tosin was playing for them at the time. And he, he couldn't do their next tour because Animals as Leaders got their first tour. That was essentially what happened. So they were out of a guitar player. And then Tosin did that. They, I think it was like Between the Barry to Me, Vale of Maya and Animals as Leaders. It was like a three band thing. And that was the first gig Animals, or, or first tour Animals got. And then so when Tosin bailed to do that, Born of Cyrus needed a guitar player. So I was like, well, we have like three months, All Shot Parish has three months off. I, I'll do it, I'll just fill in. And then I did that. I did that first tour with them. It was like Hate Breed, Cannibal Corpse, Unearth, Born of Osiris, and Hate Eternal. Just like a very obscure lineup. And that was my first tour with Boo. I remember spending time with him in the Boo house when he was going to Boo from Alshire Parish. And he was like, he like couldn't sleep. He was like always on edge and like all nervous. Maybe like puked a few times. He was just, you know, like 
He got like the pre-stage butterflies, but he had it for like a month straight. We did the discovery, that was real sick. And then just for lack of a better way to put it, I would just complain way too much. So they kicked me out. That's pretty much as, just in a nutshell, that's exactly what happened. I would complain, so they kicked me out. And then about, um, there was like about around a 20 hour period of where that happened, where I just called a few friends, just letting them know what was up and just venting, essentially. And then I called Dan Jones from Chelsea Grant, who lived in the same area of Chicago that I did at that time before I uh, moved back over to the East Coast for a little bit. And I just jokingly said, you should let me join your band. Okay, let me call you back. Like four hours later, I was going to Europe with Chelsea Grant. And I stuck with them for like three and a half, almost four years, did Evolve, Ashes to Ashes, it was all sick. And then I just realized that I just needed to pursue my own stuff None of the reasoning behind it was like out of spite or anything like that one bit. It was literally like my exit from Chelsea Gray was completely 100% mutual. Like there was, there's no qualms or any, anything wrong or any bad blood or any animosity at all. Yeah, it was just, it just made sense. That's the only way I can put it. They wanted to do something. I wanted to do something. We couldn't, it just like, they were two completely polar opposite things and it just made sense for me to do my thing and there to do theirs and we're all still friends and it's awesome actually on the way out here I went to the airport with Dan and Jake we all rode together and they went to Oregon and I came out here I think people are going to be surprised I think they're expecting like um like you know your typical guitar solo album where it's just no guitar noodling soloing the entire time over a backing track pretty much where it's like like a, the guitar is the focal the entire time. Like guitar, in my opinion, is one very small aspect of the of the of the whole scheme. And I just want everything to sound like a movie, no matter what. Like I want people to literally listen to it and then immediately be able to visualize something just from hearing it. Like, like once the album's out and you you hear some of the longer songs, you'll definitely get an exact idea of what I'm saying. But I definitely think people are going to hear it and it's not going to be what they're expecting, for sure. I was in Virginia at the time when Veil of Maya was working on Matriarch. It was just, I think I was just coming home to visit the family and I just happened to be up here working on the album at, at the same time. So I just came up here to chill and Mark just handed me a guitar and was like, here, just track this part, you'll do it faster than me. And I was like, okay. It was awesome. I mean, he just came in and literally just ripped. I mean, we put a guitar in his hands, he tracked a bunch of stuff, wrote some cool stuff, and it was just fun. It's funny because we opened um, for Veil of Maya and after the burial when we were in high school. And now they're homies and you know I play in Vail and... and then I ended up tracking a couple rhythm parts on uh, Teleute. And then Mark was like, you should write a solo for that song too. I was like, okay, tight, I'll do that. And then I wrote that guest solo for that song. And uh, so when he went to do the solo project thing and I was all about it. I was pretty rushed to kind of get the Indiegogo up. Not that it was a bad thing by any means, because obviously Chelsea and Green, like, you know, they had to stick to their own plans as well that they have going on. And it's not like they're going to cater to me because I just quit. <laughs> so when they did finally hit me, I was like, all right, dude, we're, we're putting the post up um, about you leaving uh, today at noon. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, I hadn't, I had looked at the Indiegogo a little bit. I hadn't like gone out of my way to like, really get it entirely set up yet. So I literally had like two hours, if that, or if not a little more, I was able to talk Mike, our, our manager, and my manager as well now, to push the post back like an hour, just so I could have like a little bit more time to get the Indiegogo set up. You know, he finally put it together and we'd be like working out together or something and this one would be like, he would be like, that was 12 bucks, dude. <laughs> like every time it was like, I know, man, like, shut up. <laughs> when I started the Indiegogo, I thought about it and was like, if I can get around $20,000, I could more than likely make everything happen, no matter what. Like with anything online nowadays, the, like right when you post it, it's like an automatic, like huge influx right away because the initial shock uh, of everything. So it did like really well. It got the tent like halfway, halfway there, like 10 grand, like pretty quick. And then it started to like teeter off a little bit. But then you know, like, there's like, all those social media tricks and stuff that you can do to like help maintain income. Like it, that's why I had like anyone, since I'm not doing it on a label, I had everyone that was involved with it 
Uh, it's any, everyone's doing a guest solo. Anyone that's involved with it at all, post about it and share the link and things like that. And they would do that every now and then, like periodically and stuff like that too. And that would all, whenever that would happen, it would get like a pretty big bump, like right there that day. And just the help of all every, all my friends and stuff that are involved with it, it was able to keep it going and it uh, did well over 20 grand. Hey, this is Taylor Larson. I'm producing, engineering, mixing, maybe mastering, and playing all the guitars and writing everything for Jason for the record. Just kidding, I'm not playing any of the guitars or writing anything. Maybe a couple parts here and there. I've wanted to work with Taylor since the first time I heard P2 in 2012 like four years ago. I think that's when that came out. I remember he had hit me up after he departed the group and said that he wanted to do a solo record. And I was equally, if not more, stoked. We're Alive and Chelsea Grand did that co-headliner together, the, um, the Real Sick Tour. Obviously, bands hang out always because that's just what you do, you chill with your homies. Luke and I, so I started hanging out and we were just uh, in the back room one day and we were all chilling and he was like, dude, we should write a song together. And I was like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. So we started doing that on that tour and we got about a minute deep in, um, in, in a track and then he broke his foot <laughs> and had to go home. Um, <clears throat> so that sucked, but everything happens for a reason. Him breaking his foot made the song better because we came out here to, to Taylor and, and finished it out here, and it's fire-ass track now. And this definitely would not have came out the way it did if Luke hadn't broken his foot. It sucked that he broke his foot, and it definitely that's definitely not a fun thing. It like ruined half like the rest of his year. But for that song, it was pretty cool, I guess, in a way. <laughs> that is that is to say. Sorry, Luke. I love you. Hey guys, my name is Luke Holland and I'm playing drums for Jason's solo album. I had no idea that I would like greatly surpass my goal by $10,000. I just, I knew he would, he would reach his goal because he's, I mean, he's a machine, you know, and people love watching what he can do. So I knew that he would, he would eventually get there. I didn't know it would be that quick though. It was pretty quick. It's pretty crazy, the amount of money that he scrounged up that's insane like I, that was un, that was very unexpected i did not count on that one bit i think it's really really awesome that so many people would uh contribute just blindly almost not completely blindly everybody knows jason's super talented once i finally hit my goal before the campaign ended it was just honestly just a relief it was like this is happening like i don't have to worry about anything anymore like I don't have to cross my fingers anymore. Like it's it's going down. There, it's all the money's right there. Like it's gonna happen now. That was the majority feeling. It was just like certainty, like reassur reassurance. You know what I mean? <laughs> the record has officially started. It has. This is it right here. Just saying my album has so much shredding on it that I needed all of these drives to make it happen. Hey, hey he's here! I did. Yeah. I saw it, dude. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor and I finished up a song together. It ended up being real sick. That was the one I borrowed Misha's guitar for. We are going to visit the homie Misha, pick up one of his signature eight strings so I can track the song with it. It's gonna be sweet. Good, yeah, how are you? Good to see you, dude. What's up, cameraman? You need more pedals, bro. I need more lights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I dig the Spitfire stuff a lot. Yeah. I, I usually layer it with uh, LA scoring strings. Cause, like, this this uh, legato patch, like, will change what, what uh, and that's just the articulation you're using based off how you play. So, like, ornamento if you do it soft. Yeah. yeah, I guess I just need to mess with it more. I've only messed with it a teeny bit. You know what's kind of crazy is, uh, that guitar literally just came out of my Dixon. I just took it out of my Dixon. Mm -hmm. Like the last time this saw the light of day was in Paris, and it's in tune. Like it's kind of huh, kind of sick. That's impressive. Yeah.
could be sick on one of them. No, I don't like it wound. I just, I just, the G string always has the most problems, always, no matter what. It's a stupid string. Only looks good on women. And they're naked. ago now i feel like taylor and i finished up a song got all the sessions prepped for tracking all the pre-pro references for luke to get out of here when we went and picked him up on monday maybe So I don't know what happened, but uh, she there's just this lady. She looked very uh, disoriented. And they had four paramedics on board. I don't know what happened, but we just we stayed there for like 30 minutes. Damn. Yeah. You're not allowed to have long cables. Not I here. can't even <laughs> hold this and play it at the same time. Here. Thanks, dude. I got you. I right, appreciate I'll it. I'll be your strap. <laughs> Jason doesn't even understand when you play that. He doesn't know what's going uh, on. What song was that, dude? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you're all wait here. <laughs> I'm seriously the worst guitar player of all time. Definitely way stoked to have a drummer like Luke out here because he can play the stuff I unfortunately program and then turn it into something that's really sick and something that a real drummer would actually play. And it's been pretty ridiculous so far. When he was like, what Colin's doing? And I'm like, I'm sure he is. <laughs> but when Jason asked me to play drums for this album, it was, it was immediately kind of cool for me because I I've been wanting an outlet to just shred, you know, just do like the craziest stuff that I can, I can think of and, and that kind of stuff. And I know that Jason is, like everybody I know musically has nothing but crazy good things to say about him. So it was cool for me to, to be a part of that. Pull this off, it's gonna be really sick. Wait, wait. That's the best, dude. <laughs> wait, wait. Working with Luke was like working with a small child. Um, I feel like he didn't really know anything. When Luke first got out here, we did the two songs he knew first. He didn't know like the other eight yet. He had only just like jammed them a few times. He hadn't never played them on a kit before. I mean, I was, I'll be honest, I was a little bit worried that he was just kind of a YouTube drummer, as people think he is, but that guy could seriously shred. I, I couldn't be more blown away by what he did. Yeah, when Jason first sent me the pre-pros, I was blown away just to how unique and different everything sounded than anything I've ever heard before. And uh, it was definitely, it was a call to arms. Gotta step my shit up. When he went to track the first song, it was like, 
any other drummer I had recorded up until this point, like if if a drummer did like blast beats or fast double bass or rolls, we would usually just do the feet separate to get it clean and get it to sound right. And he just kind of, he really just played through the whole track, which is insane in itself. But when those parts came up, he just ripped them and they sounded flawless. So that was really impressive. It's definitely a lot of really fast footwork, which uh, I'm not, that's not something I practice all the time, but I had to particularly for this album. And a lot of weird accent placements with symbols. And of course, getting the ghost note, the dynamics in there. It's not all just hitting hard and loud at once. Ready? Can you hear me? But the bass is brand new. I just got that literally like it got, I got it. And then I shipped it out that night to you. <laughs> So yeah, I got to, I, had a chance to play it. Yeah, I got to play it for like two hours and then I had to immediately ship it here. You <clears throat> like that? Yeah. When, when I slept in with one, I could feel the frame, but I, and then I put the other mattress on there and it's gone. Oh, you're smart. Innovative. Oh, genius. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Oh, shit. Sick. Pose down. Mirrors. So you're gonna use the kick head as the checklist? Yeah. I like that. Mirrors. Thing here. What do you want next? Um, left foot. There's sizzly bacon. I don't know. Oh man. The side. So tired. to get everything mic'd up and working mm -hmm. and then do the heads right before you track. Gotcha. Just to like preserve them. In yeah. case you want to like jam for a while or like figure out a part or whatever. Uh, you can really? play these whenever you want. If you're yeah, sleeping yeah. and you can't sleep, just crawl out of bed, <laughs> hop on the kit. I've never slept this close to a drum set in my life and it excites me. Was that the song? Kids are gonna have a hilarious time trying to cover these drums. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that song is one of the ones that he just played. He's just like, yeah, whatever. Like That's when I heard him play a blast beat, I was like, wait a second. I think that pose down has the, all that crazy shred in it. Yeah, do you want to hear that? Yeah, we'll do that. We'll show Matt that one and then we'll get to work. Uh. I want to do it one foot. My friends is always doing one foot. Yeah, it's a bleed depending on what I get done. And what I one, two, three, four. We are done for tonight. We we're at half, half we're at half halfway. Half. Oh. <laughs> I'm spent. Titan. That's so sick. Yeah, that's so sick. Did you hear what you have before? This is a song that we wrote in high school and we would show to all our okay. friends and be like Look how fast and shreddy it is. And I'd be like, what's up, uh, dude? The best way to put it is I wasn't worried about any drum parts at all. Like, even like a lot, like he could play like all the that I programmed pretty much. Like, it was crazy. It turned out like, 
pretty much he did literally exactly what I wanted him to, like exactly what I wanted him to. I wanted him to take everything that I had already arranged and written and then just put his own spin on it and just make it exponentially cooler and something that a real drummer would play. Working with Jason is really cool because he knows exactly what he wants and just having someone with that much talent to be able to actually play the stuff that he writes is absolutely incredible. I don't know a whole lot about guitars, but I know not many, or I know many people can't play what Jason's playing. There were a few solos that he didn't have finished and I could literally just sing something to him and he could figure it out on the spot and just riff it and track it within like 30 seconds. Not like that. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, I feel like most people would think he's he works in a very unmusical way, like a very guitar pro, making sure he has everything tabbed out. But the way we worked together was completely just vibe, just bouncing ideas. And, it was awesome. I kind of just like it burn. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. It's like sounds kind of like mysterious yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah you're right. It's just really yeah. fantastic with that part. Rip it. That sounds good. That's it. Yeah, that's it. It's all floppy. Come on. There it is. And then, uh, hang on, I gotta. I gotta make sure it's. I gotta make sure it's playable. Sick if it was on time. Let's try one more. <laughs> It's the ascending pattern. I just need to practice it literally like for hours in order to be able to play it at this speed. Make it make the click twice as fast.
sounded damn near perfect. Almost. <laughs> Sounds so good, man. Especially when you only play it with your pinky. Alright, <laughs> let's do it one more time, Ricky. I got this. Uh, you want to do it again? Yeah, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it. Save this take, dude. This is the one. This is the one. This is the one. Yeah. <laughs> I have to find this video on Instagram and this part. I forgot how to play it. And it's like deep in here. The most deep. Oh, wait, I think this is it. this difficult ass part anyway. Me. Good job. I do it to myself. So that's Does that sound right? Those yeah. three. Play it one more time. Six, like, okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Sharpie right to the paint, bro. Yeah, just right, right on the guitar, <laughs> on the bass. Do you see where they are? Um, 
here. Yeah. Woo! Alright, so these are mids and that's treble and bass. Bass on the bottom, treble on the top, yeah. high mid, low mid. Okay, so. And this is in the middle and then the volume is all the way up. So this is like here. Can you uh, just Space jam goes on to it? 11. Yep. Just, just jam out on it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna play with a dime. Danny, I'm playing bass with a pick. Nothing wrong with that. I know. <laughs> uh, nope. That last, that's not what I would play. Something to that effect. Okay. One. Oh. Take one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like a pattern that where it'll, yeah. That like, bam, bam. Bam, 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 Give me the lance. Yeah, that's what, it's, what it is. That sounds so sick. It's just really hard to get it like right on the harmonic because there's no frets. completely honest guitar is cool and all but it's just like one small thing in the whole big picture and like i much rat like once you have that done then there's like unlimited amounts of stuff you can do after that what really backs up his guitar playing is his programming and all of his cinematic really crazy different i don't know it's just very cinematic it sounds like a movie soundtrack i am making a with a gong hopefully it's sick <laughs> Yeah, that's tight. That just needs to be mixed. Yeah. The other thing that's sick about this. Good to have him for production and programming and all of that because he's extremely talented with that as well. This record's just kind of happening naturally. It's like no one's rushing anything. It doesn't feel like I'm coming into work. It just feels like I'm hanging out with friends, creating incredible music and recordings. I hate working with Taylor. He's a piece of shit. I'm horrible at his job. Now working with Taylor has been awesome. Okay, I picked you. Okay. How amped are you right now on the progress of the album? <laughs> it's going pretty good so far. Everything's almost done. 
only have our own finished reamping guitars and then we start mixing every song. It's gonna be sick. I'm pretty excited. You're gonna what? I'm pissing in the bottom, baby. Fuck! Yo, we're almost done. Fuck! Let's reamp some more guitars, dude. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Ah! Come on, dude. Ah! Your dog's like trying to come help me. <laughs> He's like, what's wrong with yeah. it? Wait, Wait, what? I have like nothing. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Well, you kind of just got to get used to waking up at like two to four every day. That's okay, though, because I've read articles online saying that people that are on that kind of sleep schedule are typically the more creative ones. He's done some albums where the drums, the drum tones and everything were so sick. What's cool about this record is that it's a very technical, pristine, precise record. Jason's become, you know, that kind of player. But we're doing everything organic. You know, we have real drums. We're not relying on triggers. We might, you know, layer some samples underneath at an extremely low volume. And then in terms of guitars, we're reamping through the Friedman amp, through the PRS, through a bunch of cabs, a bunch of vintage mics. And really mixing it is just, we're using tons of analog stuff, you know, just analog compressors, analog EQs. So it's weird. It's like, we're getting it tight and, and precise and pristine, but we're kind of trying to bring an element of rawness and vibe and kind of make it feel like they're actually playing together. It was cool to, to work with a, a producer who was really, really drum savvy. And, uh, and he's a really cool guy as well, so that definitely helps. The best way for me to describe this record is... It has all the elements of a record that I would hate. It's technical metal. It's, you know, the style of music that I don't really want to work on. But I absolutely love it, and it's amazing. Really crazy different. I don't know. It's just very cinematic. It sounds like a movie soundtrack, you know? You, don't, you, you hear that sort of nowadays, but nobody can really do it that like that. Like He found a way to do that style of music and make it extremely interesting and melodically challenging. And it's just, it's fun for your ears. It's fun to just listen to. I mean, the songs flow, it feels right. And I think he's really just kind of mastered the art of doing that kind of music, you know? I don't even know if he could do this style again. I think next time he's got to do like maybe classical or I think he's about to transcend metal. <laughs> I make bullets. Did you hear it? Ah, there it was again. No, hold on, do it again. Oh, you hear it? No, I don't know what I'm listening for. It sounds like popcorn. Also too, whenever you're listening to music intently and you need to be paying attention, you can't have beanie over the ears. I lost it again. Okay, it's like right at the first half of eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> but you say like, so first listen through, like what, what were your thoughts? Like minus, minus your, the things that you want to change. Sick AF. Album Sick AF sounds very sick. Were you happy with it? Yes, very much so. Do you think the fans will Yes. Not only be stoked on it, but will, that'll blow their minds. Yeah, I don't think they're ex they're gonna get something they're not expecting. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. They're gonna hear it, and it's not going to be what they were anticipating at all, like in the least bit. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, cause you you Cause hear they're, it's on. Yeah, cause they're they're expecting like your I. I I could probably guarantee that like ninety percent of people that are purchasing this album are expecting to buy stock guitar guitar solo album where it's just you know just like normal chill cool rhythm backing and then just a guy noodling 
over every song for the duration of the entire song, just like wankery guitar solos, and that's not what it is at all. What is it? Uh, sounds like a movie. <laughs> it sounds like a straight-up movie with sick progressive metal behind it the whole time. 